Most High be praised. So grateful again to be able to come before you and to provide the teaching of the Word on this evening, this uh, midweek Wednesday evening. We just finished our time of prayer, which is always a wonderful time of being able to call upon the Most High and to intercede on the behalf of others and also to minister unto the Father in adoration and in thanksgiving for him being so great and so wonderful to us. We just bless the Almighty because he's a covenant keeper and uh, he does exactly what he has promised in the covenant that he would do for his people, to those who love him, and to those who keep his commandments. Well, for those of you who are watching us by live stream, we want to say welcome to Voice of Messiah Ministries, and we're glad that you have tuned in with us for this time of Bible teaching. Uh, today we're going to deal with a very similar topic as we dealt with last week. And uh, the topic we're going to cover today is going to be called, Was the Law or the Torah Abolished? And we're going to look specifically at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. Um, I want to say that the purpose for dealing with this particular the reasoning that many who do not believe that the Torah, the teaching of the Creator is still applicable and is still relevant in the life of the believer the Messianic Israelite, and not just for us that follow Elohim, but for the whole world, because Torah was for man to follow, because Messiah, in quoting what Moses said in the book of Devarim, Messiah said that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Elohim. So what that tells us is that the Almighty gave his teaching not just for his covenant people, but for the entire world. Because it is his teaching his commandments and statutes and judgments that, as the psalmist said, forever stands in the heavens. That which is eternal and that stands in the heavens will be the thing that will judge the entire population, shall I say, populations of mankind that have come and have went is going to be his Torah. Therefore, it's important that we emphasize the relevance and that we emphasize the truth that the teaching of Elohim is a permanent fixture in the lives of the believer. It is not their salvation. Never has it ever been used as a means of salvation, redemption, or atonement. That's where the concept of under the law comes from. The belief that doing the Torah brings remission of sins and atonement. And so, in emphasizing the importance of the necessity and the permanence of Torah in the life of the believer, um, we need to discuss very similar 
to the verse that we dealt with last week. Last week we dealt with the verse over in Colossians, the first chapter, where it gave the idea that the Torah had been nailed to the cross. And the phrase that was used was handwriting of ordinances. Now in this particular verse that we're going to look at, we're going to see the same word showing up. The same word. And we're going to deal with that term from the Greek that it initially is translated from. But before we get there, we want to read some verses beforehand that's going to preserve the context. And then we're going to discuss some other things also. Not just uh, that particular verse, because there's some other things that need to be discussed as well. So let's begin. We want to go to Ephesians uh, chapter 2. And I'm going to begin at the 11th verse, as that will bring me up to the 15th verse. But I want to start at the 11th verse, because it's important that we catch the context of this. It says, Wherefore remember that you in past time, or in time past, as Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision circumcision in the flesh made by hands. I'm going to stop for a moment because I just want to provide just a little explanation. In the beginning of this portion that we're reading, the Apostle Paul is speaking specifically to those believers who have come out from the nations. The term here is... Gentiles, as used, is referring to those who have come into the house of Israel from the nations. So with that in mind, we shall proceed. He says that they were called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision. Those who are the circumcision are those who are regarded as blood descendant Judean Israelites, commonly called Jews. And it says in verse 12, that at that time you were without Messiah. Now, in the past time, those who were Gentiles, they were without Messiah. He's talking about remembering the past time. So now he's talking about what that past time was. It says you were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So notice something. In this verse, Paul says that in that past time, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Or shall I say you were aliens from citizenship in Israel. And so the present situation as to what Paul was dealing with at that time of his writing was that these Gentiles who had come into the Messiah, they had came into the house of Israel. This is what Paul is saying. If they had not come into the house of Israel, then there would be no need for Paul to make the comparison of them being aliens to citizenship in Israel. Okay, you catch that? So it's important that we understand the language of this text, what Paul is saying. The reason why uh, he's saying this is because during the first century, the first century Messianic Israelite community was not a new church as many believers in our era believes. Messiah did not come and set up a new church. What he did was come and initiate the renewed covenant, commonly called the new covenant, and then he ratified that covenant with his death 
on the cross and then rose from the dead to secure it. But here, <clears throat> Paul is talking about how those who were Gentiles, they were aliens from citizenship in Israel or the commonwealth at that time, and they were strangers from the covenants of promise. As he continues, he says, having no hope and without Elohim in the world. So here, Paul is talking about the previous condition or the previous situation of those who were Gentiles. And I say those who were Gentiles, I like using the phrase those who were formerly called Gentiles, because these who of the Gentiles in which they had came into the Messiah, they were not Gentiles anymore, but they were Israelites now. And so this is the idea and the understanding. And as we continue you're going to see how that idea and how that concept is cemented and how it's crystallized and how that is what they understood in the first century. So now we look at the 13th verse. And after talking about what they were, what the Gentiles were, in verse 13 he says, but now in the Messiah, Yahshua, you who were sometimes far off are made close by the blood of the Messiah. So he's saying that you who were sometimes or in times past were far off. You have now been brought in by the blood of the Messiah. Verse 14, for he is our peace. More accurately, it, it should say he is our shalom. See, Paul is he's using Hebrew concepts and Hebrew terms, and those Gentiles that had came into Israel understood things hebraically. This is, this is important for us to know this. But sometimes when this particular book is taught, is taught in a way almost as if to say that there is no association with the Hebraic nature of the faith of Israel. But Paul is making it very clear in the writing when he talks about these Gentiles that you were once aliens from citizenship. So he's showing that their present identification is being connected in a part of Israel, and that Messiah is our shalom. Now, the term shalom is the term that I like to use uh, instead of peace. Peace has a very limiting uh, meaning in our English definition. But when we talk about shalom, shalom means well-being. He is what makes things correct and right and perfect. He is the one that makes things the way they're supposed to be. Shalom. Now, it says, He is our shalom who hath made both one. He says he's made both one. Those who are of the nations and those who are of the Jews the blood descendants, he's made both one. Now, there's a reason why Paul is bringing the information out like this, and I'm going to touch on the reasoning a little later because we're approaching that verse that I want to highlight. But I'm giving all of this information in connection with it because it's important that we catch the context. So it says he's our shalom. Those who are of the nations and those who were already a part of Israel but had to receive the renewed covenant in the Messiah Yahshua. Because you see, when Messiah initiated the renewed covenant, he himself initiated that renewed covenant by being baptized himself. 
And I'm not going to talk about baptism to today in detail and how that is a uh, indicator that a new covenant is on the uh, horizon or, or is present. Okay, but Messiah himself was immersed in water, which from Hebraic thought and Hebraic thinking meant that a new covenant or a renewed covenant, a renewal of the covenant was in operation. That's important that we understand that. So we find that every Israelite that came into Messiah had to get baptized. Because what was going on was being a renewed covenant and all who came in, both those Israelites with whom the promise of the covenant had been made, according to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, and also the Gentiles, both had become one in Israel. Let's not get it twisted. It's not a new church. But both are one in it. The reason why Paul is mentioning it this way is because he wanted those whom he was writing to to understand is that in the mind of Messiah and in the mind of, Elo, in the mind of Elohim that it was not to be viewed as here you have those who are full citizens in Israel, and then you have the half proselytes, which was the religious situation of those who did not become circumcised, but wanted to serve the Elohim of Israel. So in the Messiah, Within the framework of the renewed covenant, there was no two-tier system. Even though uh, circumcision was not mandated, there was not a two-tier system. And I need to say that because as I he says here that he hath made both one and has broken down. Now listen to this real good. He has broken down the middle wall of partition. Hmm. So he's broken down the middle wall of partition. So what he's saying here, that there was a wall that separated and that divided the blood descended Israelite and the Gentile that wanted to come to Elohim and serve and worship. There's, there's some uh, powerful insight that Paul is bringing out here, and there's a reason why I said it. But I'm going to get into the 15th verse now. So he said that he's made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition. And in verse 15 it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the Torah of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of two one new man so making shalom. Now, what I want to focus on and just spend the next roughly uh, 10 minutes on is the portion of verse 15 where it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Enmity referring to the enemy. It says, and then he calls this enmity the Torah of commandments contained in or called Antinomians. And I've used that term to refer to those who are against the Torah being in the life of the believer. Okay? They use this passage of scripture just like they use the scripture found over in Colossians chapter 1 where it talks about that the handwriting of ordinances was nailed to the cross. Here it talks about the Torah of commandments contained in ordinances. Now, as I said uh, last week, 
that Messiah had made it very clear that the Torah is permanent. You read Matthew 5, chapter 5, verses 17 through 19 in full context, and he makes it very clear that he has not come to destroy the Torah or the prophets, but to complete them. That's what the term fulfill means, to complete them. He came to complete the body of Scripture. And then he said that not one jot, which is a yod in Hebrew, or the part of a letter would pass away from Torah until everything is accomplished. And then he said, heaven and earth will pass away first before the yod and the part of a letter passes away from the scripture. Noted that Paul in Romans chapter 3 verse 31 stated, since we have this faith, do we then make the Torah void and without effect? He said, never shall it be, but through faith we uphold the Torah. So we find that Paul never made any explicit statements that Torah was to be removed or to be canceled from the life of the believer, but that it was to be upheld. That's the purpose of Torah, to be upheld to be lived out, to be obeyed, because it is what reveals the righteousness of Elohim demonstrated in living. It is the way of set-apartness or holiness. So now, what, is it, what does it mean when it says the law of commandments contained in ordinances? When we look at the Greek, because I have the uh, Greek interlinear, which is uh, what I always use, and what we find here when we look at that phrase, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that word ordinances, it should be decrees, because that's what is literally translated here, but the word in Greek is Dogma sin. Dogma word that Paul used when we dealt with the scripture last week, where you find the phrase handwriting of ordinances. We have this word dogma sin. The term dogma sin, it means the interpretive rulings. That's what the term means. It has to do with the interpretation of a body of work that has been systematized and a ruling has been made regarding it. As I had mentioned last week, I talked about how that in Bible college there is this uh, term called dogmatics. Dogmatics is a term that's used to refer to the interpretations of scripture that have been crystallized. So like if you want to know about Christology, they would call that's the doctrine of Christ. So if you want to know about the dogmatics of pneumatology, that would be the dogmatics or the theology on the spirit. So the term dogmatics, it comes from that Greek word dogma, which is the root word for dogma sin. And it refers to the system of interpretation. It has to do with the system here, this phrase called law of commandments contained in ordinances. It's a phrase which during that particular time in the framework of Judaism, because during this time, the, the Messianic Israelite faith of that time 
was considered a branch of Judaism, a sect of Judaism during that time. It was called the sect of the Nazarenes. And they knew what that phrase meant. Law of commandments or the Torah, the Torah or the mitzvot of the, in the Torah, it's contained in an interpretive system that brought about rulings to the people. So what is that? It's basically the tradition or the teaching of the Pharisees. We talked about this last week. Messiah made a statement to his disciples and he said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. When he was talking to his disciples about it, they thought he was referring to food. And he said, no, I'm not talking about food. You see me feed 5,000, 4,000 people. He said, I'm talking about the teaching of the Pharisees. Beware of it. Messiah also called it the commandments of men. And during that time, the Pharisees was in the process of developing this the Talmud. First is the Mishnah, that's first what it's called, and then the Talmud, which is the commentary on the Mishnah. So what we have here is the traditions of the elders in Phariseeism. Some, some call it the Oral Torah, but this is what this is referring to. It's referring to the commandments, the Torah, the Torah of commandments contained within a flag. Now that theological system on Torah, the interpretive or the dogma that the Pharisees had on Torah was literally bondage. And Messiah talked about the Pharisees and the religious leaders when he was rebuking them and he said that you put burdens on people that you yourselves will not even bear. And it was all through their teaching. So this contained in dogma or in the Pharisaic system of interpretation was the enemy. It separated the Gentile believer from the blood-born Israelite. And so you say, well, overseer, how did it separate? Well, here's a case in point. When you go look over in Acts chapter 15, when Elohim was saving the let's take, for example, Cornelius. And Cornelius was actually a fearer of Elohim. And those who were called fears of Elohim, or commonly called God-fearers, they were actually half proselytes. And when the word of Messiah was brought to him, he was filled with the Holy Spirit immediately. I'm talking about Cornelius. He was filled with the Holy Spirit immediately. And so as other Gentiles who were house of Israel in some form or fashion, because most of them initially were God-fearers or fears of Elohim. So they had an attachment already. Um, the thing that separated them was the fact that they were not circumcised. And those who were of the Pharisees that had come to Messiah, they were the ones who were emphasizing that those who were of the Gentiles needed to be circumcised also in order for them to be saved. And that was the major dividing issue right there. So Paul in his writing, he is telling the Gentile believers, he said, listen, you all are full-fledged citizens of Israel. He said that when Messiah died, the blood that was spilled, it brought you in. And it also abolished that Pharisaic theological system on the Torah. In other words, 
Pharisaic interpretation of the Torah that brought bondage, the Messiah got rid of that. Now those who don't understand Hebraic culture and what was going on in Judaism in the first century, they look at this verse and they think that Paul is saying that the Messiah abolished the Torah. And as I mentioned last week, that there's no way in the world that the Messiah would abolish the Torah, the pure Torah that is, and then be telling his people that it's going to continue to heaven and earth past. We have a real serious problematic issue if that's the case. And we know based upon the historians that have written about the first century Messianic Israelite community, they all make this same statement. And this is what they say in their language. That the Christians did not differ at all from the Jews. Now when the historians make that statement, they make the statement referring to those who followed the Messiah and those who were non-Messianic or they did not follow the Messiah, but they were still keeping Torah. The historians note that other than that they believed that Yahshua from Nazareth was the Messiah. That's historical documentation. So when we take that history and then we apply that to what is written in the scriptures, we need to corroborate that together. And we need to ask the question, if that is the case, then that means that the Messianic Israelite community, the believers in the to the commandments. And if that's the case, they did not get the message that the Torah was eliminated because they were still obeying the commandments. Not for salvation purposes. They were keeping the commandments because they were obeying what Yahshua said, where he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But they all understood that what the Messiah did was take the interpretations of the Torah that the Pharisees, and, I, and I'm making this very specific, because we need to look at the passage of the scripture. Just like last week, when we dealt with the passage of the handwriting of ordinances, it did not say Torah at all. It did not say law at all. It just said the handwriting of ordinances, which is the handwriting of the interpretations, the decrees, the interpretations, of the scriptures. Here it says the Torah of commandments contained in the interpretations. So anytime you take the word and you put an interpretation on it where it loses its original intent, it becomes a commandment of men. Which is the same thing that the Messiah said when he was talking to the religious leaders when they asked him, hey, your disciples, they don't wash their hands before they eat. They're breaking the tradition of the elders or the instruction of the elders. And the side by the instruction of the elders have broken the commandment of Elohim. So Messiah made it very plain that what they had created in their system of interpretation on Scripture, it had actually went against the initial intent of the Father. That's what the Messiah nailed to the tree. That's what the Messiah abolished. And so it's important that we understand that. That is what the Messiah delivered us from and took out of the way. That was the middle wall of partition that divided the Gentile 
from the blood-born Israelite. It was that system of Pharisaic interpretation, which is now, and you can go and check this out too, which is now already done up in the form of what is now the Talmud. So if you want to go and read the Talmud and check out the tradition or the teaching of the elders within the framework of Phariseeism, because rabbinic Judaism of the day is the offspring of Phariseeism of the first century. So go read the Talmud. You're going to discover a lot of stuff in there that has nothing to do with the intent of the Almighty. But these are interpretations and rulings that the rabbis had taken from Torah and had practitioners of rabbinic Judaism today. But in this verse that we dealt with, we need to make it very clear. Messiah did not nail the Torah to the cross. He did not abolish the Torah he abolished the interpretation of the Torah as it was brought forth by the Pharisaic religious system of that time. Because that is what divided the people. So, now I want to continue. Apostle Paul brought this particular point out. He brought it out to show that the blood-born Israelite in the renewed covenant through the Messiah. And those who are of the nation, so the Gentiles, are one. And notice he uses the phrase, middle wall of partition. Now there are many out there when they read this middle wall of partition. Some might think, well, oh, it's just a phrase that Paul used to describe the, the barrier or the thing that separates the blood-born Israelite from the Gentile. But what Paul was referring to was something very specific. And those whom he was writing to during his time understood exactly what he to really show the significance of this, I need to point us to the temple. Because at the temple, within the, the framework of Pharisaic Judaism of that day, you had those who were full-fledged Israelites by blood, and you also had those who converted to the faith of Israel and became full-fledged citizens. And the way they did that was by, if you were a male, you, you, you uh, got circumcised, you offered a sacrifice, and you were immersed in water. You were baptized. See, baptism is always a part of the process of entering into the covenant. Very significant. So, a person who was a Gentile, pagan, that converted, they would go through that process. And they would have full rights and citizens citizenship in Israel. So when they would gather together at the temple, they would come into this area of the temple grounds called the court of Israel. All right? And they would be able to enjoy everything that had to do with the temple service. They could come in, offer sacrifice. They would be there with the celebration uh, in the temple. And all of that, that would go on. They would hear the choir singing as they would offer sacrifice and offering. All that would go on. However, the court of Israel had a wall that enclosed all of those who were full-fledged citizens. That wall was called the middle wall of partition. That middle wall of partition separated the court of Israel here and the court of the Gentiles out here. Outside of the middle wall of partition was an area called the court of the Gentiles or the court of the nations. 
and all of or half proselytes, these were your fearers of Elohim or God fearers. These were individuals who did not want to get circumcised and undergo full conversion. Because if you didn't get circumcised, you weren't going to be baptized. Because those two things went together. But you wanted to follow the Elohim of Israel. All right? That person would come before the leadership and they would make a pledge that they would keep the, keep the holiness code. And the holiness code was a... Um, <clears throat> was a section in the book of Leviticus where it enumerated all of the things that were related to sexual immorality that they were supposed to keep, that was related to blood issues that they were supposed to keep. Um, it also related to idolatrous practices that were forbidden, that they were supposed to keep. And the fourth thing had to do with uh, ritual slaughter of animals that the scripture said can be eaten. In other words, that whole section had to do with the dietary commands. So the God fear or the fear of Elohim, they were keeping the whole holiness code, holiness code. This also included the Sabbath as well. So they were living a Torah observant life. The only thing that they were not able to do is that they could not be involved in giving sacrifices. They could not come into that area of the temple, which was called the court of Israel. They had to stay on the, the outside of the wall that part that was called the court of the Gentiles. And so while they had this relationship to Israel, where they were able to enjoy the Almighty to some degree, there was not a full union. This is how it was within the framework of Pharisaic Judaism of the first century. There was not a complete union. And the uh, Israelites that were full-fledged citizens, they would not eat with these half-converts. They wouldn't go into their home and eat with them, even though they were eating clean. And the reason why is because they were not circumcised. That was the thing that separated. And there was this middle wall of partition that surrounded the temple proper and the area where the uh, Israelites would go in to worship in the area of the temple. So in looking at that Pharisaic uh, Judaism format, when Paul was preaching and teaching, Paul was saying, it's not like that. And, and, and check it out, back during that time, if you were not circumcised, you better not dare come up into the court of Israel because the Sadducees were the ones who controlled everything regarding the temple. The high priests, all of the other priests, the Levites, they were all a part of the sect of the Sadducees. And so they weren't about to let anybody up in there that was not circumcised. So there was not a union that was complete within the framework of Pharisaic Judaism. You always had that two-tier system. Those who were circumcised and those who were not. And so Paul was saying, listen, you who were called uncircumcision in your flesh, now that you're in the Messiah, you have been circumcised in your heart, you are one in the Messiah completely. And there is no middle wall of partition anymore. You catch it? This is what Paul was saying. There is no more middle wall. Taken the interpretive system of the Pharisees and has abolished that. This is 
the context of that verse. And I had to bring out the other information because when we look at these statements, in particular this one, we need to understand that the reason why Paul made the statement is to show the comparison. And most Christian Bible teachers that are not, but you've got to go back to the first century. You've got to go back and understand what the circumstances were in the framework of Pharisaic Judaism and in the framework of the sect of the Nazarenes, which I call the Messianic Israelite community. Because amongst those who were in the Messiah, there was no two-tier system. And while some Pharisees, Paul was saying, listen, that middle wall of partition has been removed in the Messiah. And there is a union of the two in Israel. And so it's important that we understand this. Um, I'm going to read the rest of the text. Um, in verse 16 it says, And that he might reconcile both unto Elohim in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached shalom to you which were far off, and to them which are not, or close. He preached both to the blood-born Israelite and to those who were of the Gentiles. It says, For through him... We both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Notice, notice this, this language. He said, we all have access to the Father by one spirit. See, when the temple was there, the temple represented the place where the Father's throne was. And there was a middle wall of partition that separated the half proselyte from being able to come in and share together. Paul is saying, I hope y'all catching this. Paul is saying, I want you to check this out. He's saying that for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more, woo, my, 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 listen to this. He says, now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with. Paul says here is that you who are Gentiles, you're not strangers anymore. You're not foreigners anymore. You are fellow citizens with the set-apart people, with the Israelites. You are a part of us now, he says. You are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of Elohim and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Yahshua the Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a what? A holy temple in Yahuwah. In whom you also are built together <laughs> for an habitation of Elohim through the Spirit. See, Paul writes all of this showing the comparison of the physical temple and the stuff that was going on in the first century with the spiritual temple and how we are connected as a temple and connected with Elohim. So Paul was showing the natural and the spiritual and how that in Messiah there is no separation. There is no middle wall of petition. But we are all in union together by one spirit. We have access to the Father. We have access to go into the whole body when I read this. Because when you understand this from the Hebraic cultural perspective, it makes perfect sense. And the thing that we want to continue to highlight is Paul never said that the Torah was being abolished. 
But the thing that was our enemy is Pharisaic interpretation of Scripture. That was our enemy. That is what was nailed to the tree. And as we understand the Scripture and rightly divide it within the understanding based upon the culture of the first century and the understanding of Pharisaic rabbinic Judaism, which they had to deal with all the time. We see that Paul is never going against Torah, pure Torah, but he's dealing with Pharisaic teaching, the interpretation that was not the intent of the Father that was placed upon him. That's what he was dealing with. And so I hope that this teaching has helped to shed some light and bring some clarity to you and that it would cause you to have a greater appreciation for Torah in its purest. That that's the way of holiness that the Almighty has given for every human being to live and to walk in. I trust that you were encouraged and that you were blessed by this. We pray that the Almighty cause this word to break down some barriers and to break some yokes and to bring conviction in areas of our lives so that we might live before him and please him. According to truth. The most high blessed each.